His name is synonymous with the words fighter pilot. He was the ace of aces, the most deadly aviator of World War I. The ultimate duelist, he personally shot down an astonishing 80 aeroplanes. He was a supreme professional in a new and deadly profession. And 75 years after his death, combat pilots continue to study his aerial tactics. Recent generations of Americans may recognize him as the unseen foe of a cartoon beagle who imagines himself a World War I flying ace and his doghouse to be a sop with camel. But long before his battles with Snoopy, he was a legend all by himself. A young Prussian cavalry officer who took to the air in a personal quest for glory and became the most famous wartime aviator in history, Manfred von Richthofen. Manfred von Richthofen was born in German Silesia on May 2, 1892, into the kind of aristocratic family of middle rank who were the backbone of the Prussian military tradition. Manfred was the first of three sons born to a retired career military officer, Albrecht von Richthofen, who had suffered injuries in the cavalry. His father was a uh, retired military officer. He had a disability. He was uh, clever enough to marry a landed woman who had lots of money, and they lived a, a nice life. Uh, not luxurious by modern standards, but by the standards of Silesia, the quite uh, luxurious. In landed aristocracy, money was not the main thing. Land was everything, and so there wasn't a lot of currency. For example, uh, Manfred von Richthofen was not sent on a world tour as a young, rich, uh, aristocratic Englishman might have been. Instead, uh, he was a part of their hunting scene. Uh, he, he was a hunter from early on. As a boy, Manfred was an indifferent student, preferring hunting and horseback riding to his lessons. Until he was sent away to school, the young baron would spend hours alone on the family estate hunting small game. It became a passion he would carry the rest of his life. At the tender age of 11, Manfred was enrolled in military school to prepare him for the Royal Prussian Military Academy in Lichterfelde. I entered the cadet corps as a boy of 11. I was not particularly eager to become a cadet, but my father wished it, and I was not consulted. Manfred von Richthofen. The military school background really prepared him for what he had to do in combat. He was a smaller than average uh, young man, slight of build. He became very competitive in sports. He set out to beat the bigger boys at uh, their own game, the bigger boys, the older boys. It uh, gave him a great sense of self-discipline, the proper sense of self-denial. And so you could say that Manfred von Richthofen began becoming the Red Baron the day he walked into military school. Manfred received no better than passing grades in his studies. In spring 1911, he emerged from the Senior Cadet Academy and joined a crack regiment of cavalry, and by that fall was commissioned lieutenant. Life as a young cavalry officer agreed with him. He was being paid to do one of the things he liked most, riding horses. It would not be long before his profession required he make the most of his other favorite passion hunting. In June 1914, Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the Habsburg throne, was assassinated in Sarajevo. Austria declared war on Serbia. Russia mobilized in support of Serbia, and days later Germany declared war on Russia, and then France. The Great War had begun. At the beginning of World War I, the aeroplane was little more than a decade old. To many, it was considered a contraption with no serious purpose in war. But the machine gun was fast changing the face of modern warfare. Infantry on both sides were forced to dig entrenchments to escape its fearsome killing power. Cavalry, the traditional means of reconnaissance and swift attack, was suddenly obsolete. Balloons were launched for observation, but these were large and stationary, easy targets for enemy guns. Seemingly overnight, the aeroplane became strategically vital, first as a way to observe enemy ground movements from a safe altitude, and then as a means of aggression, preventing the enemy from looking at your ground movements. Piloting these early fighter planes required a special blend of skill, endurance, keen eyesight, courage, and marksmanship. There were plenty of volunteers, 
To the soldier in the trench, the prospect of soaring above the horrors and lice-ridden privations of the front lines was like a dream, and flyers they knew could look forward to clean sheets and hot food every night. The dream was a far cry from reality. The life expectancy for a new pilot was two weeks. Soon after the outbreak of hostilities, Manfred von Richthofen found himself an officer in an outmoded service, and worse, assigned to supply duty. In this manner I passed several months, and now I had enough of it. I sent a letter to my commanding general and evil tongues report that I told him, My dear Excellency, I have not gone to war in order to collect cheese and eggs, but for another purpose. At first the people above wanted to snarl at me, but then they fulfilled my wish. Thus I joined the flying service at the end of May 1915. My greatest wish was fulfilled. Manfred von Richthofen. Von Richthofen was transferred to an aviation training unit in Cologne to determine his suitability as an aerial observer. Combat in the sky had escalated. Reconnaissance flights became bombing missions. The role of observer evolved into that of gunner, first with pistols, then rifles, and ultimately machine guns. The development of fighting in the sky was, was a direct byproduct of the technology of the airplanes and the weapons that, that were uh, designed at that time. The problem is when you're flying an airplane, your legs are busy with the pedals, your hand is busy with the stick, and your other hand is busy man managing the engine. You don't have any freedom to shoot at other people. One solution is to put an observer with the gun. That means two people. That means weight, that means a bigger airplane, clumsier maneuverability. The other solution is to put a machine gun fixed on the airplane, and then the job of the fighter would be to point his airplane, using it as the gun, to shoot at the enemy. That ability to have the airplane maneuver to the firing position is what develops uh, modern aerial warfare, the uh, dogfighting techniques. Their basic concept was kind of to come aside an aircraft and shoot at each other like sailing ships out of the Napoleonic War. One Russian, uh, who probably gets the award for the most innovative person, he actually used a gappling hook to try and bring down an airplane, and he did. He also brought himself down at the same time. Anthony Fokker was a young Dutch aircraft engineer who, since 1913, had been manufacturing German warplanes and wrestling with the problem of arming them. The problem was how to have the machine gun fire without hitting the, the propeller. The French ace Roland Garros had a triangular steel plate put on the propeller so that when the bullet struck the propeller, it would deflect the bullet. That's not the optimal uh, solution. You're going to be bending your propeller and, and you're going to have bullets flying all over the place. Gouros shot down four or five aircraft in this manner when he himself was shot down. Uh, his aircraft was examined by the Germans and uh, Fokker was asked to develop a, a gun that could fire through the propeller but not hit the propellers. Legend is, is that uh, Fokker did this in a week. Actually, it's felt that Fokker had been developing this idea for a long period of time. With the development of Anthony Fokker's interrupter gear for front-mounted machine guns, the war in the sky began in earnest. Combat pilots kept score, recording their kills. Competition grew within units. A new term was coined for the flyers with the most kills, ace. The shining knight on the white charger image was developed from these men who had the courage and the temerity to go out with the purpose that they were going to shoot down an enemy airplane. And if they lost, they, they lost their life. They didn't have parachutes, there was no escape. And if a fuel tank was hit, they had a horrible death. So it was a form of jousting, and this attracted the public attention, captured their imagination. The war was hideous. Uh, flying was new, flyers were already popular in Europe, but the combination of the flyer-soldier, the, the man who had a series of victories, was absolutely intoxicating to the press, and so they became lionized. Uh, uh, they would get gifts from all over, uh, they'd get dozens of boxes of cigars, boxes of chocolate, uh, women would send them mash notes and so forth. So it was a phenomenon that occurred in all countries. 
To the boy Hunter, the glory of this new game was irresistible. War in the Sky held for Manfred von Richthofen the promise of everything he valued and longed for. Adventure, danger, the hunt, and ultimately, glory. He had been born and bred for this conflict, this adventure. It was his time, his destiny, and he knew it. The next morning at seven o'clock, I was to fly for the first time as an observer. I was naturally very excited, for I had no idea what it would be like. We drove to the flying ground and I got into the flying machine for the first time. Before I knew what was happening, the pilot went ahead at full speed. I clutched the sides of the car. Suddenly the machine was in the air and the earth dropped away from under me. I lost all sense of direction above our field. I had not the slightest notion where I was. I began very cautiously to look over the side at the country. The men looked ridiculously small. The houses seemed to come out of a child's toy box. Everything seemed pretty. It was a glorious feeling to be so high above the earth, to be master of the air. Memoirs, Manfred von Richthofen. If you are an observer, calling the fall of shells, dropping bombs and so forth, it's not noted in the presses. If you're a pilot and shoot down four airplanes or five airplanes in the course of a week or so, your names are in all the communiques, your names are in the popular press. Uh, the Germans were much more concerned about their aces than were the other uh, countries. Uh, all of the German aces appeared, for example, on uh, postcards that were sold around the country. And it's uh, quite a bit of uh, pleasure to see your countenance on postcards being mailed all over the country, and, and Richthofen wanted that sort of uh, glory. Not content to be an observer, Richthofen persuaded a friend to teach him to fly. In October 1915, Manfred von Richthofen soloed for the first time. The day that he soloed, he crashed the plane on landing. Richthofen was not a good pilot. Richthofen was an excellent marksman. And his ability to shoot was what made him what he was. Recently, I nosedived into the ground with my Fokker. Witnesses were more than a little astonished when after quite some time, I crawled out of the heap of rubble totally unhurt. I am entertaining the thought of going to Bolka and asking about becoming his student. Manfred von Richthofen. Oswald Bolka was Germany's ranking fighter pilot. By the time Richthofen joined the air service, Bolka was already famous as a flying ace. Richthofen and Bolka met first on a train uh, on the Eastern Front, and Richthofen approached Bolka and asked him, how do you do it? And he said, I just get close. And Richthofen thought that there's got to be more to this, but the answer was that you just get close. And the reason for that is, is that the vibrations and air currents around a World War I aircraft are so great that at 100 yards, that bullet had a probability of being anywhere within a 30-foot circle. And so it was absolutely essential that you get as close to the enemy as possible in order to bring him down. Richthofen, once he got uh, into the Air Corps, wasn't necessarily the best pilot that Oswald Boca had ever seen, but Boca worked with him. When I was a student, a, uh, an instructor, and then commanding officer of the adversary squadron, we taught much of the same things that Oswald Boca taught Richthofen how to fly. Richthofen, Oswald Boca, Immelman were the pioneers of Top Gun and modern day flying today. Bolka had established a set of rules for air fighting and self-preservation called Bolka's Dicta. He taught them to his eager young students, including Richthofen, his most famous exponent, who proved them in action and passed them down to future generations of pilots. Rule number one, get close, preferably at an angle where you can shoot him and he can't hit you. Climb before the attack to get speed and dive from the rear. Use the cover of clouds and the glare of the sun. Attack when the enemy least suspects it. Wait till the enemy is within range and in your sights. Turn as tight as you can to wind up on your opponent's tail. Never turn your back and run. Foolish acts of bravery are fatal. 
uh, aerial combat's essentially murder. Uh, you, the ideal aerial combat for any pilot is to come up behind the other guy when he doesn't know you're there and you kill him and the battle's over. That's the ideal combat. Uh, the idea of saying, I'm here, let's fight, is not, not ideal combat. One of the pilots had asked Balka, who do you think will be the hotshot in this group? And he pointed to Richthofen. Now, this is before Richthofen had done much. But he had seen this quality in Richthofen and realized that Richthofen had this capability. As a rule, when they first came to the squadron, they usually lived about two weeks. And the reason for this was they could not see uh, in the air. They could not see another airplane two or three miles away. This was a developed uh, skill. When von Richthofen first came in the unit, he had still not become a wildly proficient pilot. He was still not the acrobatic ace. In fact, he eschewed aerobatics. He, he just thought that they were a waste of time. But he was a superb marksman, and it was not long before he began scoring. And uh, once he had begun scoring, then his star was on the rise. As a young hunter in the woods around the family estate in Silesia, Manfred would bring home trophies of his kills. These would be mounted and hung on the walls of his room. In this way, he kept record of his achievements. In October 1915, as an observer, Richthofen had shot down a plane, but the kill could not be confirmed. The following March, a pilot now, he shot down a French Newport, but still could not get confirmation. On his first mission under Bolka, Richthofen shot down a British plane, and this time the frustrated flyer landed his plane next to the wreck of his victim and cut the serial number off the plane. This time, he would have confirmation. That night, von Richthofen ordered a silver cup from a Berlin silversmith as a trophy. He would continue to follow this tradition, one plane, one cup, until late in the war when it became too difficult to find silver. By that time, he had 50 cups on his mantelpiece. The serial numbers themselves, strips of linen cut from the sides of his victims whenever possible, literally papered the walls of his trophy room. When Richthofen watched Bolka die, and he saw it from the air, right alongside of him, saw the crash, saw the wing disintegrate in the air, and at this point in time, he knew that Bolka had it. The shock to the unit was probably a realization that if this could happen to him, Bolka, the master, it could happen to me. At first, Bolka went down normally. I followed him immediately. Later, one of the wings broke away and he went rushing down. His skull was crushed on impact. He died instantly. It affected all of us very deeply as if a favorite brother had been taken from us. The funeral was like that of a reigning prince. In six weeks, we have had six killed and one wounded. Two are washed up because of their nerves. Yesterday, I shot down my sixth and seventh. My nerves have not yet suffered as a result of the other's bad luck. Manfred von Richthofen. On the day of Bolka's funeral, British pilots dropped a wreath with a note that read, to the memory of Captain Bolka, our brave and chivalrous foe. That same day, von Richthofen went aloft sought out a British plane and shot it down, exacting a measure of personal vengeance. It is here that the legend of the Red Baron begins. The death of Bolka left the stage clear for a new player to capture the imagination of the German people and fuel the propaganda machine. Manfred von Richthofen was ready. A month after the death of his hero, Bolka, Richthofen confronted the British ace, Major Lano Hawker, who with nine victories was the first recipient of the Victoria Cross for air fighting. The duel began at 10,000 feet. I was soon keenly aware that I was not dealing with a beginner, for he did not even dream of breaking off the fight. To be sure, he had a very maneuverable crate, but mine climbed better, and so I succeeded in getting above and behind the Englishman. Manfred von Richthofen. Richthofen's machine guns jammed as he closed in. Flying his plane with one hand, he banged on the guns with a small hammer until at last they cleared, and he was able to fire a burst, killing Hawker just 150 feet above the ground. 
Von Richthofen was a success because he was a very intelligent hunter. He knew how to make an attack, and he, of course he had great confidence, which is half the battle. He, he would go in expecting to be triumphant, and, and he usually was. In January 1917, with 16 victories to his credit, Lieutenant von Richthofen was given command of his own fighter squadron, Jagdstaffel 11. Though it pained him personally to leave the comrades of Bolka's old squadron, he recognized the opportunities such an advancement presented. Two days after receiving orders to Yasta 11, a telegram from headquarters informed Richthofen that Kaiser Wilhelm had awarded him the achievement he had sought so aggressively, the Poor Lemerite, or Blue Max. It was one year to the day since the same honor had gone to Bolka. When Imperial Germany came to honoring the, its first two highly successful fighter pilots with a decoration that has become popularly known as the Blue Max, uh, they gave it to two pilots who had shot down eight aircraft apiece. One of those pilots was Oswald Brilke, who was Richthofen's mentor and role model. A year to the day later, when Manfred von Richthofen received this same award, he had shot down 16 airplanes. The ante had gone up. By the end of the war, he had to shoot down 30 airplanes to get the Blue Max. When Richthofen arrived at Yasta 11's airfield at Labrael, he was Germany's highest scoring ace. As a leader, he planned to take up where the great Bolka had left off, surrounding himself with the men he thought had the greatest potential for success. Then, with stern and patient guidance, he would mold his team into an efficient and deadly fighting force. In March 1917, Lothar von Richthofen, who had soloed for the first time a month before, joined Manfred's squadron, eager to make a name for himself independent of his famous brother. You couldn't have two brothers that were more different. Richthofen was very reserved, very cool, uh, very standoffish. He was also about five feet five. His brother Lothar was six feet tall, an extrovert, and one of the most popular people in the squadron. The only connection they really had was the competitiveness or the sibling rivalry that sometimes exists between two brothers. We doubt whether Manfred ever really had a girlfriend. We don't ever doubt whether Lothar had a girlfriend. He had lots of them. Richthofen was unequaled as an instructor. Every young pilot who came to his staff had to fly a few times to the front alone with Richthofen. After the flight, the details of what the beginner had seen and experienced were discussed thoroughly. Lieutenant Friedrich Wilhelm Lubert. Almost on a whim, the legend of the Red Baron is born. For whatever reasons, one fine day I came upon the idea of having my crate painted glaring red. The result was that absolutely everyone could not help but notice my red bird. In fact, my opponents also seemed to be not entirely unaware of it. Memoirs, Manfred von Richthofen. So he painted this plane red. This is a pretty audacious thing for somebody to do. I mean, this, this guy really had balls, and that's no better word. It had become known that the British had put a price on my brother's head. Every flyer on the other side knew him, for at the time he alone flew a red-painted aeroplane. For that reason, it had long been our wish to have all aeroplanes of our Staffel painted red, and we implored my brother to allow it so he would not be so especially conspicuous. Lothar von Richthofen. And Richthofen said, no, no, mine will be all red, yours will have to have some other color. So Lothar painted his red with yellow, Schaefer painted his red with black, Almanroder painted his red with white, Wolf painted his red with green, and so forth. The red color signified a certain insolence. Everyone knew that. It attracted attention. Consequently, one had to really perform. Lothar von Richthofen. April 1917. Bloody April. In the course of one violent month, the British Flying Corps had one-third of its active planes shot down. Richthofen himself accounted for 21 of them. By the last day of April, newly promoted Captain Manfred von Richthofen had 52 confirmed enemy kills, 12 more than his hero, Bolka. Headquarters ordered him to go on leave. 
Manfred turned the reins of Yasta XI over to Lothar and prepared for a triumphant return home. The Kaiser wanted to meet him. On the day he lunched with the Kaiser, May 2nd, 1917, Germany's Ace of Aces celebrated his 25th birthday. The young ace had captured the imagination of a nation. In his spare moments, Richthofen began to dictate his memoirs to a stenographer. The finished book, The Red Battle Flyer, was an immediate bestseller. Manfred von Richthofen tells the story that at one point, a man came up to him on the street and had a pack of 50 postcards with his picture on it and asked him to sign them. And so Manfred was so delighted with this new hero status, he signed all 50 postcards. And then the man walked away and started walking down the street and he was selling them for twice what he paid for them because they had Richthofen's signature. And then after that, that's when Richthofen realized, well, being a hero is nice, but there are people who will take advantage of a hero too. Perhaps as much to escape from the public eye as to renew himself, Richthofen holidayed in the Black Forest. Here he could relax with a familiar pastime recalling the carefree days of his youth. The hunter went hunting. While Manfred was on leave, Lothar was shot down by Captain Albert Ball, Britain's 20-year-old ace. Ball crashed and died after the engagement. Lothar escaped serious injury, but little more than a week later was shot down again. This time, the wounds were more serious. Manfred von Richthofen returned to the Western Front with new responsibilities. He had been appointed commander of the 1st Jagdschwader, a fighter group composed of four Yasta squadrons. Geschwader I remains to this day the most famous assemblage in aviation history. It was known as the Flying Circus. They called it a flying circus because it traveled by train just like circuses do. The, the Germans were shorthanded. They had to have their aircraft mobile so that they had a uh, system by which they could pack up on a train, move 40 miles, and be ready to go the next day. It was an outstanding system used again in the Second World War. That July, in a skirmish with a flight of British two-seater biplanes, the image of Richthofen as invincible warrior suffered a staggering blow. I watched as the observer in great excitement fired at me. I calmly let him shoot, for even the best sharpshooter's marksmanship could not help at a distance of 300 meters. One just does not hit. Manfred von Richthofen. Two German aircraft came at us head on, and I think that the first one was Richthofen. I recall there wasn't a thing on that machine that wasn't red, and God, how he could fly. I opened fire with the front Lewis, and so did Cunnell with the side gun. Colonel held the F.E. to a course, and so did the pilot of the all-red scout. Gad, with our combined speeds, we must have been approaching each other at 250 miles an hour. Second Lieutenant, Albert E. Woodbridge, Royal Flying Corps. Suddenly, there was a blow to my head. I was hit. For a moment, I was completely paralyzed. My hands dropped to the side, my legs dangled inside the fuselage. The worst part was that the blow on the head had affected my optic nerve, and I was completely blinded. The machine dived down. Memoirs, Manfred von Richthofen. Richthofen regained consciousness and was able to land his plane on a grass field behind his own lines. I had quite a respectable hole in my head, a wound of about 10 centimeters across. In one place, clear white bone remained exposed. My thick Richthofen head had once again proved itself. Memoirs, Manfred von Richthofen. Richthofen the man had been shot down, yet the Red Baron's image as the invincible warrior, bolstered by the German press, continued to fly high. Captain Richthofen took pains to assure his men he was not badly hurt and would return to duty shortly. The value of his presence as a source of inspiration and morale was not lost on him. Besides the headaches brought on by his head wound, the German ace suffered from other powerful stress factors as well. He was losing far too many good pilots due to equipment. Our aircraft, quite frankly, are ridiculously inferior to British aircraft. The Sopwith triplane and the Spad, as well as the Sopwith Camel, play with our albatross. In addition to having better aircraft, there are far more of them. The people at home have brought out no new machines for almost a year, only these lousy albatrosses. Manfred von Richthofen. The German high command, in view of Richthofen's importance both as leader and propaganda symbol, ordered him not to fly unless it was absolutely necessary. But the Red Baron would not be grounded. I have been told by people in high places 
that I should give up flying, for one day it will catch up with me. I would be miserable with myself if now, burdened by glory and decorations, I were to become a pensioner of my own dignity in order to save my precious life for the nation, while every poor fellow in the trenches endures his duty as I do mine. Manfred von Richthofen. On August 16, 1917, 40 days after he was shot down, Manfred von Richthofen was in the air again. Accompanied by four aircraft from Staffel 11, he claimed his 58th victory. The experience left him dizzy and exhausted. By the end of the month, the long-anticipated new Fokker triplanes were arriving in Richthofen's command. On September 1st, Manfred scored his 60th victory in the new plane. This three-winged model, while not as fast as the British Sopwith Camel or the French Spad, was far more maneuverable than the Albatross. With Richthofen in the cockpit, it would become one of the most famous flying machines of all time. That September, Manfred began the four-week leave he was all but ordered to take. He hunted for relaxation, but was interrupted with the news of the deaths of his close friend Kurt Wolf and his chief rival Werner Voss. On a visit home, his mother noticed a change in Manfred. To my horror, I have ascertained that Manfred's head injury has not yet healed. The bone is still exposed. Day after day, he goes to a local medical aid station to have his bandage changed. He does not look good and he is irritable. Previously, it seems to me that he was like young Siegfried, the invulnerable. Freifrau von Richthofen. I am in wretched spirits after every aerial combat, but that is surely one of the consequences of my head wound. When I put my foot on the ground again at the airfield, I go directly to my room. I do not want to see anyone or hear anything. I believe that the war is not as people at home imagine it, with a hurrah and a roar. It is very serious, very grim. Manfred von Richthofen. Before returning to the front, Manfred attended the wedding of an old friend and was mistakenly reported by a confused local journalist to be the bridegroom. News of the Red Baron's marriage made headlines all over Germany. Manfred wrote his father to assure him the story was false. I cannot indulge myself in the right of marriage as long as I am liable to die any day. I myself could imagine quite well enjoying my life as a carefree bachelor right up to the blessed end. Manfred von Richthofen. To the world, the Red Baron seemed invincible, but the headaches from his wound reminded him otherwise. A somber, more withdrawn Richthofen returned to his command in late October. There were getting to be fewer and fewer familiar faces there to greet him. By the end of 1917, Richthofen was the last surviving member of Bolka's original squadron. Statistically, at least, his number had been up a long time. As the new year dawned, von Richthofen's score stood at 63. But with each new victory came the haunting realization that the next one could be the last. Increasingly, the leader became more isolated from his men. After he was shot down in April 1917, he had combat fatigue, plain and simple. He kept pushing himself to the limit and beyond as he had done before, and uh, would come back from flights uh, with pounding headaches, and uh, just, just, just got to be in worse and worse shape. He, he really should have quit at that point. On the 27th of March, 1918, Rick Tofen shot down three British planes to bring his score to 70. More and more of his victims seemed to be perishing in flames, a fact that had begun to haunt Manfred. I could see the pilot and the observer twisting out of their aeroplane seats to escape the flames. The machine did not burn in the air, but gradually burned on the way down. It fell out of control to the ground where it exploded and burned into ashes. It is a strange feeling. There are once again a pair of men shot dead. They lie somewhere all burned up, and I myself sit here every day at the table, and the food tastes as good as ever. Manfred von Richthofen. He had outlived all his rivals. Now there was no one left to challenge Richthofen as Germany's ace of aces, yet he continued to fly in his relentless pursuit of immortality. He was idolized in the German press, and for some time his commanders had been urging him to stop flying. Even his mother had asked him to give it up. 
Would it please you more if I were in some safe place resting on my laurels? Who would fight the war if we all felt like that? Only the soldier in the trenches. When the professional fails at leadership, it will soon be as it is in Russia. Manfred von Richthofen. By April 1918, the Flying Circus had moved to Cappy Airfield, a desolate base with rain-soaked tents serving for barracks that depressed Richthofen. In my dugouts there hangs from the ceiling a lamp I made from an aircraft engine. It came from an airplane that I shot down. I mounted light bulbs in the cylinders and at night the ceiling looks fantastic. When I lie like that, I have much to think about. I write this down without knowing whether anyone other than my closest relatives will ever see it. The battle now taking place on all fronts has become dreadfully serious. There is nothing left of the lively merry war as our deeds were once called in the beginning. Now we must arm ourselves against despair so that the enemy will not violate our country. Manfred von Richthofen. On April 20th, Captain von Richthofen shot down his 80th victim. He had now scored twice as many victories as the great Bolka. It was rumored the Kaiser himself was going to order Richthofen to stop flying. Cappy Field was fogged in the morning of April 21st, delaying the takeoffs of Richthofen's squadron. At around 10.30, a strong wind began to clear away the mist. It came from the east, which was not a good sign for the Germans, who relied on the predominant westerly winds to aid their escape home after a fight. As Richthofen was about to climb into his triplane, a mechanic asked him to autograph a postcard. What's the matter, the ace asked him jokingly. Are you afraid I'm not coming back? Richthofen took off in his new Fokker DR-1 triplane, painted dark red. Approaching the front lines, the Germans encountered a flight of Sopwith camels led by a Canadian, Captain Roy Brown, and began pairing off into individual skirmishes with the Royal Air Force Flyers. A young Canadian second lieutenant, W.R. Wap May, newest member of Brown's squadron, dove on a triplane but jammed his guns in the process. He turned and ran for home. Richthofen spotted this easy target and went after him. The first thing I knew I was being fired on from the rear. All I could do was try to dodge my attacker. I noticed it was a red triplane, but if I realized it was Richthofen, I would have probably passed out on the spot. I kept on dodging and spinning from about 12,000 feet until I ran out of sky and had to head chop over the ground. Richthofen was firing at me continually, and the only thing that saved me was my poor flying. I didn't know what I was doing myself, and I did not suppose that Richthofen could figure out what I was going to do. Second Lieutenant, W.R. May, Royal Air Force. Captain Roy Brown saw May's predicament and dove to the rescue. Before Richthofen knew he was there, Brown fired a burst into him. The German ace turned around as if in surprise and then slumped to the side. I felt that he had me cold, and I was in such a state of mind at this time that I had to restrain myself from pushing my stick forward into the river as I knew I had had it. I looked around again and saw Richthofen do a spin and a half and then hit the ground. Second Lieutenant W.R. May. The Fokker bounced and skidded to a stop in a sector held by Australian troops. Neither Wap May nor Roy Brown had any idea the downed German pilot was Richthofen. Australian infantry found the young captain frozen to the controls, dead. A single gunshot through his chest had pierced his heart. At least twice during Richthofen's pursuit of May, running at barely treetop level, the German had been fired on by Australian machine gun emplacements on the ground. The caliber of bullets they fired was the same as those from Roy Brown's guns. To this day, despite extensive investigations and studies, no one is certain where the fatal bullet came from. Captain Roy Brown was unofficially credited with the victory. The controversy about von Richthofen's death exists primarily because he is so famous. Everybody wanted to be the conqueror of the Red Baron. Roy Brown, the man who, for most people's opinion, shot him down, was really quite modest about it uh, for most of his life. He became a little bit irritated when the Australian gunners firing from the ground claimed to have done it. I think that we'll never know absolutely for sure. I think probably it was Captain Roy Brown that shot him down. There's a great controversy as to who shot down my friend von Richthofen. The camp is pretty evenly split, in my own view. The evidence strongly suggests that uh, since he was flying so low, uh, literally down the Sum Valley and at eye level with infantry soldiers, 
It looks to me like uh, an Australian infantryman got lucky. He just fired the fatal shot and put it right through him. My conclusion is Roy Braun shot him down. It is a little bit more glamorous and a little bit more acceptable that he was shot down by a knight of the air than some infantryman on the ground. Rick Tofen's body was examined by Allied medical officers, then laid out inside an aeroplane hangar. The following day, he was buried with full military honors in a small French cemetery by the enemy with whom he had fought so ferociously the last three years. A funeral wreath bore the inscription, to our gallant and worthy foe. Rick Tofen, when he was taken from his crash plane, and as soon as they knew who he was, was treated with extraordinary kindness. The things that the British did, I found absolutely amazing. There was an autopsy. When did they ever autopsy an enemy pilot? And why? They did that, and then the burial with honors. This is totally extraordinary. The Red Baron's death was a terrible blow to German morale and came at a bad time as the big offensive on the Western Front was beginning to falter. He had been a champion, a symbol of invincibility and pride, and his fall foreshadowed the bigger fall to come. It's just tragic national news, and then he went from a national hero almost to a national martyr because he, he had died this warrior's death. It was a, a very Teutonic thing. He was this, the, the modern embodiment of the old Teutonic Knights, right down to the Iron Cross design on the wings of the airplane. He was a member of the aristocracy himself, and he died nobly in battle. At that point, the legend of Manfred von Richthofen begins. The glorification of this man persists to this day. There's probably been more books written about Manfred Freyer von Richthofen than Abraham Lincoln. He was a personification of a noble spirit. In 1925, seven years after Germany's defeat, Richthofen's remains were taken by train to Berlin, where they were reburied in a place of honor. Twelve years later, Hermann Goering, who eventually succeeded Richthofen as commander of Jagdgeschwader I, dedicated a much larger memorial on the same spot, hoping to appropriate the Richthofen legend for the Third Reich. But even in death, the memory of the noble warrior could not be sullied in the mire of Nazi propaganda. Rick Tofen, the Teutonic Knight, is immortal after all. The man had fallen, but the myth endures. The legend of the Bloody Red Baron has never been shot down.